Hello, everyone. My name is Arif Khan. I'm the director of the UNM Art Museum. Uh, thank you all for attending our first ever uh, virtual program. Um, this panel talk was scheduled uh, to happen in April. And of course, we had to unfortunately postpone that for due to the global pandemic. Um, but we really want to thank you all for making the time to attend this virtual presentation today and for our panelists uh, to work with us for rescheduling and being able to present it to you now. Um, if you are new to the UNM Art Museum, I encourage you to um, follow us on social media, media, Instagram and Facebook, as well as um, to visit our website and sign up for our emails. Um, we've been quite busy over the past few months. We've done some virtual exhibitions. So there's a lot of information there that I think you'll all enjoy. Like all museums, the pandemic has disrupted our normal rhythms and operations. I can't thank enough all of the staff at the museum for their professionalism, creativity, and dedication over the past six months. I'd also like to thank the members of our student advisory board who have stayed connected with us remotely and to thank them for their dedication to the museum and for all their work. If there are any UNM students out there who are interested in, in signing up for the student advisory board, please look at our website for information. We'd love to have you on board. This week, we welcomed a small class of seven printmaking students to the museum to view works in our collection. These were the first visitors we've had in the museum since March, and it was so great to see students back in our museum. To all the students out there, know that we are thinking of you and are willing to provide support as you navigate the challenges of pursuing your education during these times. This program is made possible through the Eileen and Walter Cleveno Lecture Series Fund. Eileen and Walter are longtime supporters of the UNM uh, Art Museum. We thank, thank them for their support. We hope you're watching at home and that you enjoy this program. I'd of course like to thank our panelists again for working with us over the past couple of months to arrange this program. And last but not least, it is my pleasure to introduce Mary Statzer, our curator of prints and photographs, who will be moderating this program. Thank you again for attending. Hi, I'm Mary Statzer, curator of prints and photographs at UNM Art Museum. I'd like to start by acknowledging the people of the Pueblos of Sandia and Isleta as we are now on the land that the Tiwa people have called home since time immemorial. We also acknowledge the other Pueblo tribes, as well as the Apache and Navajo peoples who shared this land before us and who continue to be integral parts of our community. We are grateful and committed to every opportunity to further strengthen the University of New Mexico's relationships with the native communities of New Mexico. I am joined today by three inspiring women and art professionals. Terry Greaves, Dakota Hoska, and Jill alberg -Yo. This program has been organized in conjunction with our exhibition, Indelible Inc., Native Women Printmaking Collaboration, which is currently on view as a virtual exhibition. The program tonight will begin with introductions, after which I'll turn things over to Terry, Dakota, and Jill, who will be in conversation with one another for about 30 to 40 minutes. After that, we'll shift to Q&A. We're allowing a full 30 minutes for your, conversa for your questions. Um, we really, really want to hear from you. We also solicited questions from UNM students and faculty in advance of this program. I'll be moderating the Q&A with help from our museum assistants and Devin Geraci. I've asked Jill, Terry, and Dakota to talk about the unique process of curating um, the landmark touring exhibition, Hearts of Our People, Native Women Artists for the Minneapolis Institute of Art. It opened at the Philbrook Museum, or it's going to open at the Philbrook Museum in Tulsa, Oklahoma on October 7th and run through January 3rd. And if you don't have this catalog, I strongly recommend it. It's spectacular and it's just a wonderful reference and um, beautiful and inspirational. Um, this show was uh, my inspiration for Indelible Inc. So I couldn't be more thrilled to have um, these um, women um, curators and artists here tonight to talk. Um, this exhibition was guided every step of the way, that's Hearts of Our People, uh, was guided every step of the way by a panel of 21 indigenous and non-indigenous experts in the field. Um, our panelists will tell us about their unique curatorial model, 
one that should be the professional standard, not an exception to the rule, as well as enduring intersectional battles of race and gender discrimination in the making of, of all exhibitions. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce Dakota Hoska, who is enroll, an enrolled member of the Oglala Lakota, Lakota Nation, located on Pine Ridge Reservation. Her family name is Little Moon, and many family members still live in Wounded Knee. Hoska recently began a position as the Assistant Curator of Native Arts for the Denver Art Museum after serving four years as Curatorial Research Assistant at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, supporting the still touring exhibition that we'll be speaking about tonight. Dakota completed her MA in Art History with a focus on Native American art history at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota in, the, in May of 2019. She completed two years of Dakota language classes at the University of Minnesota in 2016. And she received her Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in drawing and painting from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design in December of 2012. Welcome, Dakota. Terry Greaves is a beadwork artist who lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She is enrolled in the Kiowa Indian tribe of Oklahoma. Terry follows and updates the Kiowa tradition of beadwork to tell the story of the American Indian, both contemporary and historical. Her works include beaded books, jewelry, and even high top sneakers. Her work is found in public collections, including the Heard Museum, the Museum of Arts and Design, the Brooklyn Museum, the Denver Art Museum, the National Museum of the American Indian, the New Mexico Museum of Art, I'm sorry, the New Mexico Museum of Art, and the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. Hi, Terry. Jill is the Associate Curator of Native American Art at the Minneapolis Institu Institute of Art, also known as MIA. In 2008, Auberg Yo received her PhD from the University of New Mexico. Her dissertation was a focus on the social life of weaving and contemporary Navajo life. Along with Terry Greaves, Jill co-curated Hearts of Our People. At MIA, Jill seeks new initiatives to expand understanding and new curatorial practices of historical and contemporary Native art. With that, I'll turn it over to Terry, Jill, and Dakota, and I'll see you back here in about 35 minutes for the Q&A. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you. So we'll start off with a video, if you could play the video. Thank you to all of you for having us here in your homeland. We really do appreciate uh, you allowing all of us from all these different places to come here and to this institution that has given us a chance to be able to put an exhibition together like this. Um, that looks at our art uh, from our perspective as uh, Native women. What is Native American art? Baskets, pots, beadwork, quill work, leather work, textiles. When we walk through a museum collection like the one that's up here and we look around and we see those objects, the majority of what we're looking at is made by women's hands. And that hasn't, I don't think, really been recognized Native American art in the United States has been defined by the outside. And so that recognition that we were the ones that were driving this isn't quite clear. I'm a painter and mixed media artist. I'm a writer mostly, and sometimes I get to work with visual artists. Mitakiapi, Gracie Horn, Imachiapie, Sisitu Aukbatu Oyate, Mitioshbe, Naku Standing Rock Nation. Southside Minneapolis, Edward T. I come from a long line of weavers, and I always say that weaving is my thread to sanity. I always strive to find the women in the scholarship, and it's not there. And when you go into a community, the number one thing is all of the beautiful ways that people express who they are through the works that women have made. And you can't find that in the scholarships. I'm really, really excited for the public and for future generations to be able to find the information. And I hope that we're going to do really good work here. So thank you very much for including me. I think this exhibit brings together something that's been needed for a long time and also 
can draw on the histories of feminist art history as long, uh, along with the very powerful discourses of Native American women. I think this is an incredible opportunity that we all have right now because we are not doing this for the women in here. We are doing this for our children that will be coming up to see this and our future children. If you could move to the next slide, please. Terry, do you want to start us off? Sure. So um, many years ago now, <laughs> not sure how many, five, six, Jill Alberg Yo came to me with a proposition that we do, that I help her, or she asked me to assist her in um, creating an exhibition about Native American women's art. And um, I immediately said, yes, I have been working as a Native American woman artist my entire life, my entire, entire professional career. My mother owned a trading post in Fort Washke, Wyoming, where she sold mostly Native American women's work. Um, I have been embedded in this world and in this life and in the creation of, of women's hands since my birth. And so when she asked me to be a part of this, to co-curate it, I immediately said, yes, I was honored to be asked and to be a part of it. However, the very second thing that came to mind was is that I have absolutely zero rights to speak for anyone, um, even my own people as I'm not an elder. So um, it was uh, imperative to me that we asked many people that had better knowledge than either one of us combined or alone to help us understand what this exhibition was going to be um, and to help guide us as we did it. Um, and so, as I've said before, as a Kiowa person, I cannot speak for Lakota. I cannot speak for Seminole. I cannot speak for any other nations out there. I, and, and I felt that um, my responsibility was, um, as a Native person, was to help her find the other right people that would help all of us together come up with a much uh, more solid and rounded understanding of what this is because this exhibition had never been done at this level before. Just adding on to that a little bit, as a, um, I'm trained in anthropology, I'm a graduate from UNM, Go Lobos, and I, um, I, I entered uh, art worlds, I uh, entered art museums, and a, a, a constant um, statement that was given to me, that was said to me all the time was, Jill, you must maintain curatorial authority. You must, the, the museums are about curatorial authority. And I said, what does that mean? I really honestly did not know what that means. And I've said on a variety of occasions, that means many different things to many different people, but I knew what we did not want that to mean. We did not want that to mean that it was coming from, from Terry and Dakota and my perspective solely. And that we knew that we had to have a comprehensive approach of one in which we drew upon the strengths of all of these women from all across the United States, what is now the United States and Canada, who offer a wealth of meaning and, and, and authority to, to be able to create a show such like Hearts of Our People. I guess one of my primary roles, uh, you see a larger group here in this photo and um, secondary to having the exhibition advisory board, we also had a community advisory board and that started putting that group of people together started really early on in the process. And at this initial meeting, we had uh, a native advisory board that uh, Jill was already trying to put together and throughout our efforts that kind of changed and evolved, but uh, the voices of the community we were serving were really uh, also at the forefront of our efforts. And we maintained that through the exhibition um, everywhere except for Washington, D.C., um, probably because of the nature of the federal institution there. But in the other places where we have had this exhibition, there have been community boards that have been involved in um, what that what this exhibition might mean to those people in that place um and so for us this exhibition even though it is all across the united states it started specifically in minneapolis 
It started specifically with the Shakopee, Metawakatan, and 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 in that in their homeland. And so, as it moved Tennessee, and then now down into Tulsa, as it's moved around, it is it was incredibly important to us that what we started here with the community being involved was maintained throughout its travel. And I, I would add that the institution also really supported that, especially like our learning and engagement um, uh, departments, because right, right after this symposium, they started to put in into place programs that were sustainable, um, that could continue on up until the show and after the show. And the show was, well, we didn't know it at the time, but it ended up being like a four year endeavor. So um, putting those things in place, I think really helped to cultivate a better relationship with local community too. And I think that happened in Tennessee as well. And most definitely is working in Oklahoma. So it is, it's not just the exhibition itself or certainly the subject matter of the exhibition. It's actually in how you engage with native arts in the place where you are, in the place where your institution is, and in the communities that, that hopefully your institution is reaching out to. We heard time and time again at, um, at MIA, you know, don't just come to us when there's this large exhibition that's happening. Develop relationships with us um, and come to us. Come to us and come to what we're doing in the community communities all the various things that are happening in the community so that was one of the things that that um, we did at mia is develop those relationships for for a long-term process and one that is enduring and one that we're committed to um, to this moment and as a native person who's asked to be an expert and sit in i've sat on advisory committees before for other exhibitions and my experience helped inform how I didn't, what I didn't want to do with this exhibition community committee, which is bring them in for one meeting and then sayonara, we never see you again, not even for the, not even for the opening at the end. And so our engagement with our board members, we didn't just rely on them initially for that planning process at the beginning, which is typical for most exhibitions, I mean, all that I've ever been involved in as an advisor have all worked that same way. We actually asked them throughout it. We had questions for them throughout it and really leaned on their expertise, their community knowledge, their cultural knowledge, all of those things, the reasons why we asked them. They're not just artists. We didn't just ask them because they were artists. This isn't just an artist led curatorial committee. We asked these women because not only are they artists, they are also incredibly informed members of their community and culture bearers. That's why they were asked. We were asking the PhDs of our native community to, to come and speak for their communities and representing them in this broad thing. And so, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought on that. But no, just, that, yes. to that, to that point, I, it is, it does need to um, kind of, Sometimes we forget the process itself, but just to reiterate the process, we came, we, we asked um, 21 board members to come to Mia with the one question, why do Native women create? And we created this, this exhibition from that one question with no other um, um, intentions or any ideas beforehand with any checklists of objects that were curated in. This was completely generated from these women, whether it was themes, object checklists, programming, all of that input, which was a four, four and a half year project. That was something that it was a constant back and forth, this reciprocal kind of um, cohesive collective unit, where it wasn't, as Terry said, where you're asked to be on a board and then something happens and then a cre uh, that there's this exhibition that's created. These board members helped us in every aspect of the show. They helped co-create this exhibition. So all of them actually should be here tonight in a, in a way and they, and, and they really are and that's expressed in the show. Um, um, and, and, and you can, when you see the images of the uh, exhibition in um, upcoming images, you will feel that presence. You will see that 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 spirit and that that essence of this collaborative spirit is is really materialized in the way that we create what we create in what we created. 
And it's part of the reason why we had so much blowback because we had chosen such, as far as I know, I mean, Jill knows better than I, you, you and Dakota know better than I, I don't know that a collaboration at this level had ever been tried before. But what we understood, I think really clearly was, is that, you know, Jill can have a PhD in Navajo textiles all, you know, all day long. Any one of us can have these PhDs in different materials, but it is until you ask the people that are in the community actively engaged with it to bring their perspective into it, how do you really know, you know, because they're engaged with it in real time. It's not in a book that was written 20 years ago or some theoretical whatever, this is practice. And so it was just incredibly important to us to have all of these experts in their fields, not just artists, technical skill workers, but experts in their fields come and participate in what we were doing and how we were doing it and continue to help guide us along the way. So collaboration, coordination, um, the idea that we weren't gonna push forward if there was resistance, we didn't push forward. We didn't push our agenda over the top of whatever these women were saying to us. There were multiple times where they stopped what we were doing and said, no, we can't do it this way. And here's our reasons why. Okay, so it was Jill and I's uh, business then to go and tell the higher ups, okay, we're, we, we're not gonna do it this way, we're gonna do it this other way and you know, try to negotiate what that means for the higher up so they understand, but also make sure that these ladies who we had asked to graciously give of themselves would continue to trust us, to trust that we were not gonna override or overwork or over talk over what they were telling us was important for their work and how their people understand it. Yeah. And I would just like to add that the results were fantastic. And I have found um, the value of this collaboration is so much richer than if two or three of us would have put this show together. It was uh, so much more layered. Uh, the results were surprising in ways that our minds might not have gone there alone. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not saying there wasn't, you know, we presented maybe a few ideas, but what they came back with was so much better than our initial thoughts. It was really, it really made the project rich and much more beautiful in my opinion. This should be, you know, this, the thing is, is that now Hearts of Our People, it's received some acclaim, but this is the practice. This should be standard practice. Um, and hopefully more museums are looking at this model as being standard practice because to Dakota and Terry and me, this is the right way of doing things. This is just the right, this is the ethical, moral, and the, and the kind of curation that leads to the best kinds of shows in, 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 in all of its manifestations, in terms of scholarship, in terms of outreach, in terms of, um, in terms of ex excitement, in terms of the beauty of the show. This should be standard practice in, in museums. So as universities and institutions and museums go forward with this big push towards decolonization, because it's a hot topic now and everybody's talking about it, and with the death of George Floyd and a reconfiguring of what race means in America, if we understand museums as those repositories that literally tell us who we are as human beings, whether it is in study of science, and minerals or whether it's in study of fine art or whatever that is these museums tell us what we are we need to pay attention to how we are we need to pay attention to when they say they're decolonizing whether they actually mean it or not and what i have to say is is that though we receive pushback and jill has the bruises all over her body about that pushback <laughs> even though we receive that pushback the process and the methodology in all of this, this is what decolonization looks like. When we say we need multiple curators, the response should not be, don't give up curatorial control. The response should be, hmm, this is a new and interesting process for working in a way that is outside of our institutional norms. Let's take a look at it, especially since we have 21 
Native women asking us to do it this way. Like maybe it's time to pay attention to that. Maybe it's time to empower that. And that's what Mia did. That's what Jill did by cracking open the door and keeping her foot jammed in that door so that our voices could be heard. And to the point before we move on, I know we need to move on a little bit, but um, it's something that is really worth reiterating for all of the students out there, for all of the curators out there, for all of the administrators out there, what this, this was such a success in part, we had great resource that was given to us, really robust finances given to us, not because, just because of the uh, fact that this was the first show ever dedicated to recognizing that most indigenous art is made by women, which is incredible, but of our curatorial process, that's why our funding came in. And so that's something that is really important for those of you listening who, who want to do this kind of work. People believe in this process, process and people want to support this kind of work, which is collaborative, which is really truly collaborative. Authenticity always win. I heard uh, this put so beautifully this week. Um, a friend of mine said, inclusivity is inviting people to the table, but uh, diversity is who has power at that table. And I think this was a really good example of um, letting people have more power and more say than other institutions had done before. And it was sacrifice on Jill's part. I, 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 I really believe that wholeheartedly because we had, um, we had the person at the gate opening the gate for us. That's, I mean, that's a huge thing. So um, it shouldn't go unacknowledged that, that, you know, who, 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 who controls that gate. And so when we're allowed in, when that process is allowed to happen, uh, when we have people in authority that are willing to listen and to advocate and to empower, well, the result was beautiful. The result was beautiful. And it's, it, it, it's just like Terry and I believe, this is just, this is, this is the way it should be done. This is the way that we were trained. This is the way we were taught. This is the way that we are as people and it should be standard practice. So. Should we go to the next slide? Yes. Okay. I think our 30 minutes are up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we, we traveled around the country. You can see we, we went all around the country and saw amazing works of art. Um, Terry can talk about it a little bit as well. We brought um, advisory board members who were in those locations. Um, we invited them to come to any of the collections um, that, we, that, that they wanted to come to. So that was absolutely wonderful opportunity. Dakota, talk about the um, the, the pictures because you took you dealt with all the photographs for us. <laughs> I did put these in because um, I was lucky enough to be able to travel to a couple of these destinations um, uh, with these two ladies, and I was really really young in my curatorial process, and I think I learned I learned so much. And having these travels and to be in these collections uh, was. Um, really life changing for me, but also to meet some of these fantastic women in really deep ways like Anita Fields, who's shown here. Um, we went on, um, I think this is a trip. One is from Denver, I know, and one is from Oklahoma, I'm sure. Um, but where we uh, were really uh, also seeing the many ways that people were uh, holding their items, um, storing their items, what kind of items were being stored. And that was also, I think uh, Jill and Terry have plans maybe to write an, a whole book on that, but that was in, in and of itself a very interesting process. And uh, Terry and I share a love of coffee. So that's why um, you can see her feeling the burn right there. <laughs> So one of the things that we did with the with part of our process with our advisory board was is um, we took photographs of everything that Jill and I witnessed, and Dakota was with us on several of the trips as well, and also took photographs. We turned all of our images over to Dakota. Dakota loaded them all into a Dropbox folder, and all of our advisors saw all of everything as soon as they got into the Dropbox folder. And so we wanted them to see what we were seeing at the same time. 
So if there was something that was amazing or or that we had not seen because we don't can't see it the way that they can see it, that they could clue us into that. Um, we gave them access to the Dropbox folder and they continue to have access to all of the research that we found. So again, it's not over with, it will never be over with with those ladies. We are indebted to them for the rest of our professional lives over what they gave to us, which is far more than, I mean, we gave them a Dropbox folder full of images is, <laughs> is kind of it. So um, the other thing I just wanna say about this is I was, as a native person, going into these collections was very difficult for me. And I think that as a young person coming into these collections, as a young native person coming into these collections, as a young non-native person coming into these collections, as a student going into the museums, an understanding of such what it is for when native people walk into these collections. We are not just looking at beautiful objects. These things speak to us in a way that it was actually, I mean, I don't know how many times I cried um, seeing the things that I saw. Um, I can smell their fires. I can see their footprints. I can see their fingerprints on their things. And so I can hear them. And so, um, and I think that those of us that have grown up with our traditional objects, we relate to them in that way. And so when we see them loaded into into shelves and covered in poison and kept behind locked doors in the dark. Um, it is really difficult for us. And so I would say that as a young, if you are going into museum work in that, that know that as a native, that your native visitors are going to have a very different reaction than your non-native visitors. And that as native people, boy, be prepared, be prepared because what they have in those collections, you don't even know. Yeah, maybe if we could um, move the slide, um, the next, the, we could follow the next slide then and Dakota can talk about, yeah, that. Yeah, so just following up to what Terry's saying, um, part of the community uh, engagement board's reaction was this could be potentially traumatic for us or joyful or uh, any number any place on that spectrum of feelings. And so they did advise us to have um, medicine offerings available, places where people could regroup themselves because, um, you know, some of the stuff, their relatives that may have been gone from a community for, for a long time. And we, because a lot of times we don't have the provenance on these items or as good a provenance as we wish we had, we couldn't really predict when or where that might happen. So we did have medicine offerings and places for people to put their medicine uh, throughout the gallery and also a spot where they could recuperate or smudge if they needed to and um, just collect their thoughts or say their prayers. And I think that was really important. And in fact, in fact we're gonna try and do that now at the Denver Art Museum for the very same reasons. To move to the next slide. Um, and no, then the next. Good. Yes. So uh, Terry. So we had, um, we had heard from the women and there were many strands that we heard. And so Jill and I started pulling on those strands and trying to pull them together. And what we came up with was three overarching themes, words to kind of be around it. Legacy was the first, relationships was the third, a uh, second, and power is the third. And so each one of all of the objects that we have that were chosen for the exhibition, they can all flow in and out of all, all of the ways that we kind of configured them all. However, what we started with was legacy. And when, honestly, when I first walked down Mia's Hall, there, it's, a, it's a big museum. Um, uh, it's a kind of museum that has a little bit of everything from everywhere on the planet. And they have this long hall, marble hall, classic, you know, European style marble hall that you walk down. And at the end is their gallery. And as soon as I hit it, I could see Maria. 
I could see this car at the end of that hallway and I could see Maria Martinez behind her because the legacy of what this car is, this is a car by Rose Simpson. It is called Maria. It is, in, it is her ode to Maria Martinez who really paved the way for all of us contemporary Native women artists. All of us owe her well, she's the grandmother, right? She's the first Native woman to be have her work sold at Sotheby's. She's the first Native woman to have her work shown, uh, be presented in the White House. Um, she's, she's the first on so many different levels for us. And so when Rose made this car, which I had seen before, I was like, this, this is the car, this is the piece, and this is what legacy means. Legacy is that it is uh, what is handed down, and it's more than just technical skill. For so long, our women's work was considered craft, which is comes right out of the patriarchy, and it comes right out of how anthropology looked at our work and all of that. And so when they looked at our work, what they saw was design work. They said, oh, well, here's a woman, a young woman, just repeating the designs of her, of her elder females. And while... I think of it as more of a language that they were taught and then that woman is able to interpret that language, that aesthetic and all of that language that she learned in that medium into her own. And so that kind of disconnect between the two it is, has happened, has always happened and rose to me in this car. She just, she just comes right on at it. Is it woman's work? I don't know. It's a car. It's a hot rod. It's a, it's a low rider. Is it man's work? Is it male? Is it female? For her, it's a vessel. This vehicle is no more than a vessel and vessels are what her women have always made. In fact, she was out gathering uh, in the field with her mom in this vehicle. It was a mess, but she was in this vehicle and she realized, ah, oh, it's the shape of a pot. This is, this is what we do in these, in these vessels. So you can move the slide forward. You can see the beautiful um, black on black. Um, this is the homage to Maria Martinez. And the next slide, this monumental pot that is just massive in scale, unbelievable shape, the curvature, the, the mastery of, of Maria. And then the next slide, please. Oh, before we talk about these, I just wanna say Something about the Maria pot and the Maria car. We went through many iterations of our checklist, but those two pieces were the first pieces on and they never went off. There were yeah. very few pieces that were like that, that you know, all the women agreed on, all of the uh, stars aligned that you know, we were able to borrow them or have them in the space. And I think these two have always kind of encapsulated for Terry, like, and actually for me, especially, you know, after I was hearing Terry talk, like, what was at the essence of this show, this continuation, even though it changes, even though it adjusts, even though it uh, moves into a new contemporary moment, it is really a continuation of our languages. We wanted to make sure that um, we also recognized um, that we are on traditional Dakota territory. So we had um, artist um, Mona Smith. She's a Dakota um, artist. She created a, um, an installation work where um, it welcomed um, all of our visitors um, to Dakota land, recognizing the sky above the water below and the place of Bedote, which is the um, place of origin for the Dakota people. So that was something to frame, to welcome, to use as a welcoming device. Um, instead of, um, Terry has talked about this a lot about, you know, land acknowledgements and putting plaques on walls and thinking that that's something that is a recognition of, um, of, of, of territory. This is something that we, we found that it was profoundly important for us to um, recognize the work of a Dakota woman artist to activate this, this relationship and this ongoing um, a presence of Dakota people on, on what is now Minneapolis Institute of Art resides. And it is the act of moving through it right? It yeah. is the act of coming through this space and being forced to recognize above and below are the mirror. 
and that the holy waters of that place are right here. And it, it, I think it was really effective and really effective for centering even, we were visitors, like all of these objects you have to understand are visitors to this place, to where this these headwaters are and these people live. And so it was really important to us to place people first where they are, and now let's acknowledge the larger. I'm just curious, because I guess I didn't know this piece, this particular piece did not travel with the show, right? Right. Our hope was that um, there would be something like this in other venues, a recognition of maybe an installation piece of recognizing the traditional homeland. So it wouldn't be Dakota in um, in Nashville or in D.C. or at the Philbrook. So. So we can go to the next slide. These were the ladies that greeted um, as soon as they saw where they were in this place in Minnesota, then they walked through and these are the ladies that greeted them. And this was legacy for us because it, it seemed to me, um, well, certainly the Growing Thunders dress is all about legacy. It is three generations of women, three generations of Growing Thunder women who worked on that. And it was um, um, Joyce's remembrance of her grandfather giving away horses. And so everything about that, that dress, it's the one on the left, the blue colored one. Um, everything about that dress is about the legacy, is about legacy, is about what it is to remember and to be, um, gosh, to be the recipient of that much beauty and that much knowledge and that much culture and all of that. It just comes out so much for me in that particular dress because of what the women are remembering, are all of everything that's on that woman, the act of that woman dancing in that piece and all of those women working on it from grandmother, mother and granddaughter. And so it couldn't have been a better piece to open up the idea of what legacy means to Native, Native women. One of the other things that we really wanted to do is to activate the space of including Native, uh, our, our board members as much as possible. So in each of the three, um, themes that was created by the board, legacy, relationships, and power, and we got to move through those. We had beautiful videos of footage that we had taken from across the country. We had done over 25 interviews, more than 25 interviews, in which, um, and these beautiful videos, this montage, you can see them online, actually, you can go to YouTube and you'll see them online of legacy, relationships, and power. Um, and then our fellows, our Native fellows, um, um, editing them, well, actually filming them and then editing them at Mia to create, um, to have as whenever we could, the women speak for themselves. It wasn't about Terry and Dakota and I speaking for them to give the, uh, give the platform for, for indigenous artists from around the country, from around the US and the United States and Canada to be able to give their particular perspectives. The other thing that you'll see, you can see um, there's a video one of the other elements that we had that was super special, I think, was that we included the literary in this show. We had 13 works that were uh, of the written word, and we inter interviewed Lucy Tapahanza. We filmed her. We had works, um, we had uh, poetry and written word um, as early as the early 1800s, including, and this was curated by Hyde Erdrich, the very um, renowned art um, artist and um, writer herself. And so she helped create that and, and immerse in this kind of new kind of curatorial practice of including indigenous women voices as 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 entry points and as the 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 main ways to um, gather this information, as well as the variety of different kinds of art forms. I think I'll just mention that that those artists' voices carried over into the Hearts of Our People catalog too. And they really wanted that left as a legacy for future generations. Next slide. So. This was an installation piece by Sonia Keller Combs. And uh, she came down, she actually had to come and install it at every one of the places that it was shown. Um, if you know the, how they use the strings to hold the mittens, like you hold your mittens together, um, that's what these are. They're idiot strings is what they're called. 
And um, she uses this form a lot. Um, it is made with natural materials, rawhide and uh, sheep gut and um, there's sinew in it. And um, it has to do, it's a big piece and it casts shadows and it moves. It's, 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 it, it has its own life to it. And um, it was striking and many people saw it and it has to do with suicide. It has to do with suicide in Indian country. It has to do with loss and um, what we carry around our necks. I know we have time constraints, so we should probably just move yeah. on. Okay. This is the relationship section. And Terry, you're really good about talking about the Christy Belcourt piece. Can we go on to the next image? Because I think it's a really clear shot of the. Yes. Yeah. So this is Christy Belcourt's beautiful painting that if you can zoom into it, you will see that she painted it as if she was beating. So um, uh, she, was pa she painted it as if she was beating it. And she actually painted the dots in like, like a bead worker would lay the beads in, which I thought was phenomenal and beautiful. Um, this gorgeous painting shows images of um, plants and animals that are on the endangered species list in Canada. Christy Belcourt is an amazing artist, but beyond being an artist, she's an activist. And she is most concerned about this beautiful world that we live in and what we're doing to it. If any of you out there have Gen Z children or grandchildren, you need to ask them right now if they wanna have children themselves because my kids don't. They're looking at a world that is not the same world as our generation. And the beauty of what Christy is showing in this amazing painting is what we're losing. And it scares me more than anything that our children feel this so deeply that I have Gen Z children telling me that they're not gonna, re they're not gonna have babies. If anything should make you stop short and think about our relationship, who we are in this world, not to just living things. It's not just about our relationships with other people or even our relationships with animals. It is our relationships with all things. This planet that we stand on is a rock in space and we are the children of it. There is nowhere else for us to go but here. And if we don't pay attention to that, there isn't, there is nothing, there is not going to be a safe place for us to continue to live. She's telling us left and right. She's showing us. She's showing us that she's gonna shake us off if we don't wake up. And that's what Christy Belcourt is showing in this. And that's what relationships mean to Native people when we're talking about it, that it is not just a relationship that is identifiable as human to human, that it is a relationship that is beyond just the living, the inanimate and the animate. It actually goes beyond that into time and space. And that's what relationship means. It's all of that. Yes, if we could go move forward. First, I want to yell if we can get an amen. That was so beautifully stated, Terry. Yeah. Here's another example of this is a shot from the relationship. Um, yeah, an amen. Um, uh, a shot from the uh, exhibition. One of the other things that I want to point out, actually what you'll see in this photo um, are three artists that are in the um, exhibition at UNM. Emmy um, Whitehorse is on the left, the blue beautiful Polynesian piece. In the background is Andrea Carlson, Anishinaabe artist, and to the right is Julie Buffalohead. Um, all three artists are represented at the show right now at UNM. Um, one of the other things that um, was really important for us for the, from the board is for the, for the ancient and for, um, excuse me, for the historic work for, to have identified known makers as much as we could. Um, it was really important for, for so many, in so many ways of collecting, the history of collecting, um, certain kinds of materials were identified as made by an Apache artist or a Navajo artist or a whatever artist, as if all artists 
aren't individuals having individual creativity and individual insights um, and, and mastery, different masteries of skills. So what we tried to do, what our board recommended us to do is for our historic works to always try and find um, known living, uh, known artists. Um, and we had artists as early as 1810 who were identified in the exhibition. Yeah, I think anthropologically, it's always been assumed that one piece of work is representative of, a, of an entire culture, uh, which I don't think anything could be further from the truth when you know about the agency of artists. You can go to the next slide. Power. So, um, feminism, the idea of feminist feminism, um, American feminism, European feminism, um, certainly um, touched all around. Um, and power for Native women um, is not the same as it is for non-Native women. Um, and so this particular section was full of all sorts of representations and um, examples of what power means for Native women. Um, treaty belts were created as living documents of very important negotiations between nations. George Washington at the beginning and inception of the United States asked that his treaty with the Haudenosaunee be written into Haudenosaunee, which means that it had to be written into a treaty belt. That's how important he understood that the translation of what he was doing be made into the native languages of the, of the nations that were here. It was the women who beaded that very first treaty with the United States between the Haudenosaunee and them. And it was one of these treaty belts made out of uh, wampum that, that signified that power between the two. And in fact, you know, actually, this is the this is a recreation of the women raise them up women's nomination belt, and the, it's it's important to note that this is still being used within the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So they are. This is an active material object that has continued to be used. So it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be appropriate for it to be on display at a, a in a museum because it's in active use. Um, so we asked the appropriate people guided by our advisory board members who had those relationships beforehand, who knew who to ask to, to create this um, uh, women's nomination belt that um, represents that women nominate, the women are choose the leaders for the Haudenosaunee Nation Confederacy. You could go to next. This piece illustrate is by Carrie Atombi and Jamie Okuma. Jamie Okuma did the beadwork and um, Carrie Atombi, who is my sister, did the jewelry, the gold and diamonds and jewels on it. Um, it is an illustration of Pocahontas, who was one of the very first diplomats um, of, our, of, our, of our people. Um, she was tattooed, she was heavily tattooed on her face, but all of the original portraiture of her done in Europe doesn't show all of the tattoos on her face. Um, my sister understood her as a very powerful woman. Um, I think the way that Jamie and her understood Pocahontas was an idea of reclaiming her as the cutesy pie little girlfriend of the white guy who was happy to be sent off to Europe and wear fancy hats and big skirts. Actually, she was a young girl. I believe, what age was she? Like 13 or something yes, when she, she was, yeah, she, when she was pedophile married, whatever, however you want to say that, to the white leadership at the time and was gifted to him. And eventually, because of her ability to translate between her white husband and her native people, was able to have some sort of diplomatic power between those two and continue to negotiate at a very high level between her two nations. And so it was my sister and Jamie Okuma's hope that they could in some way dignify who Pocahontas was, really who she was. And so the little earrings that are hanging off the side are actually some ancient tattoo marks that might have been on her chin or face or so. 
I also think it's interesting to think about this work as art, a, a jewelry form as art. I mean, I know that's something that museums don't often either recognize or uh, collect. And while that wasn't our intent, I really like to think about the way that this pushed that boundary and opened the doors from, for jewelry artists. And I would have to say that again, um, that would be about the patriarchy and that would be about them not understanding what this stuff symbolically might mean. Um, you know, I'm, I'm loaded, I'm, I have been loaded my entire life with decorative jewelry that have very symbolic and important meaning to it. But if you only see it as accessory or some sort of fashion type of thing, and even then, like, you know, you must be paying, you should be paying attention, fashion so important, but um, how can you miss that? Other than perhaps, well, you know, it's women's stuff, so it can't be that important. Next slide. Uh, we lost Joan Hill this year, who was a great contemporary artist, but um, uh, this is such a lovely and kind of is tying back to the Haudenosaunee confet. This is not a Haudenosaunee uh, meeting, but just the fact that uh, you have this idea of women's lib, but of many Native nations, the women already had power. And here you see these women meeting ahead to decide if their warriors should go to war or not because it was their sons. And I think that's just a really beautiful acknowledgement of, of not only the power of women, but their importance and the importance of their opinions on, on big things. Women are gonna make a much different calculation in their head if they're the ones in charge of sending the young men into battle their calculations on that are going to be different than the way that the men think about it, period. Next slide. So in, this is again the power um, in, in our power section. Um, in the background you see the empowerment of two young girls um, fully clothed Osage ribbon blankets and their full um, outfits that their that their family their um, kin their women kin would uh, adorn them with and these were actually borrowed from Anita Fields as well as one of her um, childhood friends that they wore or, or, and or that their children wore um, again in, um, investing this um, notion in the show that we have to think beyond um, the, the confines of what, what constitutes what art is. And that's what I think of one of the contributions of Hearts of Our People, that this kind of, the, the, the beautiful artwork that the um, historic Osage women made, as well as this contemporary piece by Anita Fields that is, um, filled with Osage history and cosmology and understanding it's called it's it's in our DNA and you can see the DNA strips um, um, and these are based on wedding coats that were actually given um, um, in the 1700s these military coats were given to Osage men in acts of diplomacy with the United States government well they were too small uh, the way that I've heard it is that they were too small for the Osage men to wear. So the women incorporated that into their regalia and then just made them completely beautifully Osage, aesthetically beautiful. Um, and, and this is a, an homage to that power and a tribute to that work that Anita is referencing, as well as the particular history for Osage people. And I would just like to add, leading well, from what you said, Joe, the idea of the idea of new forms or new mediums, new materials in women's hands, uh, in these Native women's hands. So I'm a bead worker, and people ask me all the time, where do Indians get their beads? They're all European made. They've always been made from Europe. So this medium that was made in Europe, it has always been made in Europe that it could be used as a trade object and given to these communities, these women, these nations of women, 
and that they were able to transform this European medium into something now. If you were to take a piece of Indian beadwork, Indian Lakota beadwork, practically anywhere on this planet, it would, uh, you know, anything that has beadwork on it like that, that it would be recognized as Native American, that they were able to trans, to, to trans, transfer, transplant, transpose a medium into something that is so Indian, I find incredible. And this jacket is a part of that history, legacy, power, and relationship that women have always had in being able to transform their world through their voices, through their language, through their aesthetic, through all of that stuff. So the medium, the materials, does it matter? I'm not really sure that it does because in the end, Anita's gonna make something Osage. She can't help it. No matter what she puts her hands on, that's gonna be an Osage piece. I also just wanna talk about related to power, the, this power of community. I think a lot of times when uh, different nations are getting ready to celebrate their children, the communities are all jumping in to create the ribbon work, the bead work, the uh, moccasins, all of those parts. And that that is something else that really speaks to me about those those two uh, little outfits is, you know, it, it took a couple of women and a couple of people to pull those all together. And that's pretty, you know, normal when you're getting ready for ceremony, all the family and the community jumps into and lends that community power. Next slide. So this room uh, shows a Lakota uh, sunburst robe and um, you know, it was at first, I mean, when you walked into this room, you could feel the power of that robe. You could physically feel the power of that robe. And I, what I really loved too was that unintentionally and unknown to us that those, so the, in the background, there's this photo by Zoe Ernest, Ernest, and um, we didn't know it was going to reflect in all those ways off of the glass that we had. And I just had an overwhelming sense of the present, uh, presence of all our relatives and all our ancestors bearing witness, uh, empowered, standing in this circle of this robe. Um, for me, this was a really emotional, emotionally charged room. So the, the it, correct me if I'm wrong, but that robe was painted by Mrs. Charging Thunder. Mm -hmm. That robe is actually a buffalo from the last buffalo hunt at Standing Rock. Correct. And so they were allowed to go in and hunt one last time. And now with that buffalo, this is what Mrs. Gro uh, um, Mrs. Charging Thunder created. Behind her, that photograph is a photograph of the DAPL lines. The, so that's the, you know, the protest against the Keystone XL pipeline in 2016. Well, you have to remember now, don't forget, it was Barack Obama who didn't do nothing about that. He let that go on. He let the people get water cannoned and all that stuff. So let's not forget that picture and those people on that line what they're doing by defending that water against that oil pipeline coming through their 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 place their homelands the battle that was happening the things that are happening the 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 colonialism the structure of this government that fight but what mrs charging thunder and her time in that last battle i mean that last hunt buffalo hunt and what those people are doing in that photograph those things are the same those things haven't changed through time they're still fighting the same fight. It's still in the same place. Still in the same place. Yeah, if people want to relegate natives to like, well, that's so long ago and get over it. It happens. It happens every day in a native person's life. So let's just, let's do our quick thing so we can kind of. <laughs> yeah, just real quick. We'll just finish it off. The next slide real quick. Uh, we want to finish off by um, talking about Marianne Nicholson. This again was one of those works of art that was um, unanimously approved by our board um, immediately. And it's called Container for Souls. And within it, this is when you exit. 
So um, she, Marianne Nicholson created what is uh, in the center is like a bent wood box that is typically made out of bent wood, but she created it as illuminating um, a glass box with ovoid shapes and Northwest Coast designs, as well as many other different contemporary designs. Um, and one of the things that she has is that these bent wood box contain many times all of the, the regalia, all of the most important things in communities, in Northwest communities. And she's opening that up and making it visible for the viewer to show that, to make that um, idea open and vis visible. And not only that, she is making everybody who walks through they are implicated in that story of that container for souls. So you can see the shadows. You cannot help but cast your own shadow as a participant in the American story on her existence and her, her people's existence and their history. Um, so it was a very powerful way for, um, for our visitors to understand the implications of their own selves, their own bodies being implicated in the stories that um, Kwok -Wok -Wok, uh, Marianne Nicholson as a Kwok -Wok -Wok member uh, experiences. I'm not gonna say anything about this. Let's, uh, let's go on because we're, okay. we're out of time. Yeah. So we're just going to just real quickly state that, um, and you can go through these slides very quickly. This is to, um, just show you and illustrate all of the incredible works of art. Again, so many of them identified artists over the course of time, across time and place. And importantly, the importance of women in terms of American art and art. And Terry, you should finish this off. So I have a proposition for everyone out there. Um, Appropriation is an issue that we have as Native people. Uh, our work being appropriated and our lives and our culture being appropriated by America um, in, in service to an American identity. So the bikers that were all over Sturgis with their leather and their chaps and their silver and their turquoise and their whatever have adopted this kind of um, wild free persona of wild Native America, right? I mean, they're on their big open horses and whatever, mo um, metal horses and whatnot. Um, since the inception of this country, white people have been using Native American identity to be American. That's what the Boston Tea Party was all about. From the very inception of this country, Na Native Americans have be, have, are a part of white American identity. I'm not talking about European identity. I'm not talking about your roots back in wherever in Europe. What I'm talking about is your identity as a white American. It does not exist without Native America. We are part and parcel to who you are as American. And so with that, and if you follow my logic on that, American art does not exist without Native American art. And since Native American art is by and large, has been through time, examples of it m throughout all of the collections um, created by Native women, American art owes a lot to Native American women. And I think that it has just barely been touched upon. And I think that there is so much more scholarship to be done on this. And I think that, um, there, that there should be some kind of soul searching in American museums and American institutions as to what the story is that you're telling. Who are you? Who are you as an institution? And what is the narrative of your institution telling your visitors? Because I'm here to tell you as a native person that you're getting it wrong. And I see it all over. And I've seen it my entire life. So with that, I would just suggest that in the future, Ask Native people to be involved if you have Native objects, um, if you're working with Native people or Native things, that you involve Native people in that. If you, anywhere you are right now, whoever you are, wherever you're sitting, I just want you to acknowledge where you're sitting is Native land, all right? And there is a Native community that's around you somewhere. And you should be aware of that. Be aware that your Americanness is involved in my Kiwanis. 
Thank you. That was amazing. Uh, an amazing way to close the, the uh, sort of formal part of this program. Um, I'm inspired all over again by this work and what you all have to say about it. So I'd love to turn to some questions from the audience. Um, I want to start with a few questions that uh, came in from students ahead of our program um, and leads into, I think, um, gracefully from what you just said, Terry. So um, the question is, why only choose to display female artists' work? Is there a cultural reason? Um, another way to say what would be, does the focus on female artists who are Native American come from traditional values? Well, hopefully you were listening, person that asked that question, because I think we answered. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Do you want me to keep going on about it? <laughs> no. Um, did uh, Jill or Dakota want to add anything to that? I think the point was is that despite the fact that there have been many, 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 many shows about indigenous art, historic, contemporary, particularly historic, there has never been the recognition, the full recognition, articulated recognition that most of this, the majority of this work that is, that is in collections is created by women. And as Terry and Dakota talk about all the time, Nate, you don't have to ask a native person about that. But for some reason in art museums and for curators, this is a, a curious thing. In fact, for me, I, my own ignorance, it would took me a while to understand that I go through these collection and I'd be like, my mind would be blown away. It's, I'm like, it's, this is women's work, this is women's work, this is women's work, this is women's work, this is women's work. Why hasn't there been a show? I go through the literature. Has there been a show? There hasn't been a show. There hasn't been, you know, this um, scholarship. So that was one of the things to bring up to speed into exhibitions, this acknowledgement of indigenous women's work as being central to, the, uh, to indigenous art making and central to American art making. It feels like for years that we've been dealing with a kind of a goo goo gaga way of looking at Native American art. It's all of this idea of like, oh, look at the planes of color and the line and the thickness of the blah and the blee. It's like, what are you guys talking about? When mom and I discuss something, when we're looking at an abstract abstraction of our women's work or world, we're not talking about thickness of line and background color and whatever. We're talking about the content of what they're saying to us what they might mean, who their family is, the reason why they are doing that for their child, the connection that we have to the ancestors through time and space, all of that is on that cradle board. But if you were to only read anything that the white men have written, you would only be talking goo goo gaga. You'd be still talking about line width and color palettes and I don't know what. That's all, that's, it. that means, I don't know. Yeah, Dakota, did you want to add something? Well, I do love the Goo Goo Gaga comment. I think so, so many times, um, you know, we try to compartmentalize the full human experience. And I think what Terry is saying is like, when we look at our artwork, we're not looking just at the line and color, like that's, that's coming into that as well. But we're looking at an entire human experience, like she reiterated, our relationship with the creator, our relationship with our ancestors, our care for our families. Uh, you know, what uh, what is our uh, family group, and what how does that dictate our color or what's being designed? So, um, so I really appreciate the Goo Goo Gaga comment because I'm going to remember that and use that from here on out. But I also think what's important to remember is different cultures seem to value their women differently and our native cultures value our women and the fact that they aren't written you know when you're when your person asks is that cultural uh not really within our cultures like if you know if you ask anybody who did that work they'll know who is the good bead worker in there Thing, but we can't, you know, I think until this show or, uh, you know, I can't think of another show that would have put it so clearly in the limelight that women are valued and valuable members that contribute a lot to our cultures. And I think that's one thing this, 
this exhibition really does. The patriarchy, the hierarchy of the patriarchy has embedded itself so deeply. I was in, I was at the University of Virginia and a very nice white lady came up to me after my little spiel and she asked me, I don't quite understand, like, what do you mean the women can choose who's in power? I don't, I don't understand that. And I said, well, you know, Hanasani, they, they, they choose who their leadership is going to be. And, and, you know, they get together as the, and they, and they decide that as, you know, a group of women. Oh, so then the women have the power. And I was like, no, you don't understand. They're choosing those men to go and speak for them. And then, but they know what they're saying and they're all in agreement about what they're like. They're, it's not like the women have power over. And she caught herself at that moment. And she said, oh my goodness. She said, I, I so don't understand this that I can't understand what you mean by actual equal power. Like, I don't know what that means. And it should be noted that the Haudenosaunee are the reason we have a version of democracy now. The Haudenosaunee version of democracy is actually equitable because the women were given equal power. The version of democracy that we have now, that is not the Haudenosaunee version of democracy. So there's a lot of talk about it being the foundations and whatever, but let's just be really clear because those white men came and saw those women in power and they were like, nah, -uh. we can't give the women power like that. And they chose their own Euro version of it. Okay. All right, moving on to the next question because there are several to get to here. Um, this is another question from a student. In what ways might teachers and educators help and become allies for the voices of women and native artists in order to create genuine experiences for students that find themselves in marginalized groups. Get to know some native people. Connect with native people that, that you live around. Ask, listen, just, just, just listen, have a moment and don't speak and just listen a lot. Have, have opportunities to just sit and listen. Yeah, don't, don't try to save us. <laughs> oh, I mean that. I mean that. Please don't try to save us. We've had that for far too long. <laughs> We're good. We're good. But, you know, I, I think, you know, it's just all about realizing also like where you are at and how you got here. Like you're to this, to this person that wrote this question, it sounds like they are, they are really interested in doing the uh, something good and elevating. But I think the first step is to start discovering why was this all hidden from you for such a long time? What are those foundations? Um, and how has, how has that kept you from getting to know us better? All right, next question. Um, what challenges, what have been the challenges or struggles you have faced before and during COVID-19 with the line of work that you do? Maybe we can put this in context of um, the, the exhibition, um, the specific exhibition and the tour of it. Can you talk about you know, this is more of a nuts and bolts question about um, what's it like to um, travel a show in the COVID era? That, that'd be one way to interpret that question. Um, it just sits and waits for things to open up. Um, we opened up the, it at, my dog's barking, I apologize. We opened up at the um, Renwick and then it had to close in two weeks. Um, so that was something that was just a part and parcel of what what happened um, and now at the Philbrook it's going to uh, be in a space where they're very very careful about how they um, are going to work with the exhibition and have very limited social distancing um, having smaller capacity of uh, visitors that will be able to come to the Philbrook so it's just rolling with the punches you know it's just rolling with what what what's been given and seeing we're just thankful that um, uh, enough people have seen at the exhibition. Um, we're thankful about the catalog that that exists. 
Um, we're, we're thankful that it was opened at Mia. It was open at the Frist and for the Renwick for a little bit of time, but it's, you know, it's a challenge. The other thing that I will say is that Mia in the next couple of weeks is going to have an online presence in which all of the hoop materials, videos, our, all of our labels, all of the translations of the labels, we translated wherever we could into the indigenous language of the maker. Um, um, all of the beautiful images that will, within the next, say, two weeks or month or so, that will be avail available on artsmia.org. Fantastic, that's great to know. I'm so glad. We, we, did a, we did so much video and so many interviews, and we took all these beautiful digital pictures we almost prepared for COVID before, like we had, we have so much content already there because we were, we knew, we knew how responsible we were for the first exhibition of this kind. And so we made dang good and sure that we went all the way around it. Jill was amazing in finding a million ways to come at this so that it wasn't just viewed at one particular instance in hallowed marble halls, that it would live on through time and in place in other places, so. Yeah, and that, you know, that really speaks to me about, you know, doing things the right way in the first place makes you sort of um, more resilient for any kind of conditions, right? Now you have all this extra content that you maybe had to edit out that you can share with people. And that's just incredibly exciting to me. So I'm excited to experience the show all over again with this content, so that's, yeah, that's great. Um, another nuts and bolts question. Um, what were the biggest challenges when creating such a large panel, um, meaning the, ex um, the exhibit advisory board? I also would add on to that, you know, were there specific kind of people with specific expertise that you were looking for to make a, a sort of um, well-rounded group or, yeah, can you talk about how you selected people, how, you know, what, were there some guidelines for that, et cetera? Just one thing I'll just say in, in, um, that I have received this question a lot. And one of the things that um, is really important is that Terry and I recognized who the right people to ask. Who were the people that we knew um, had the authority and had the knowledge and had the community um, 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 roots and who were able to um, speak to a variety of different mediums across time and place. So we set it up for success because we knew that if we if we had it in the hands of these women, it was going to be successful because they were all successful women. And I've got to say, here's a really uh, short story, but um, it comes from our registrars at NIA. And they said to us, they said, you know, I wish, they said, Jill, I wish every show that we ever had was just like Mia in terms of the response from the women, um, the all of the artwork and all of the responses. We have never, we never missed one deadline. We never missed one like uh, exhibition inquiry or anything because it was in the hands of these women. And I would say that question of it, 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 it was a challenge. Um, it was logistically challenging. It was exhausting. I have a lot of gray hair and I have a lot of wrinkles from that, but it was, um, it was uh, honestly, it was um, something that shouldn't prevent people. I think that people think that, oh, because it's such a broad, it's such a big um, enterprise, it's so many people that it's gonna be more challenging. It's, it's challenging logistically, yes, but it's worth it in the long run. It is worth it in the long run. Yeah. And I love that story about how it uh, was, you know, not a burden to the, the rest of the staff, you know, that's yes. actually, yeah, that's, that's a great message. Yeah. The and they said, they said that, that they, that, that they said, I wish all of, all of the people that we work with were as true professionals as these women were. Bravo. Dakota, well, you, these women, I'm sorry, these women just took this as an enormous responsibility as I did. I literally, I mean, gray hairs and whatever, like, I mean, I gave blood for this damn show. Like this, this is like from our heart, like from the depth of whatever. I've got nothing else but this. So my heart and soul, and when you ask me to be responsible for speaking for Kiowa people and being representative of myself, my family and my tribe, my nation, guess what? I take it really seriously. 
And so those women that we asked to be a part of this also took it seriously, took the responsibility seriously. And it wasn't just about their careers. All of these women saw this as a, oh my God, like, okay, they're gonna allow us to speak for these women. We need to take that responsibility uh, with full respect and understand that this is an honor. And honestly, I know that it was billed as a celebration, the first of its kind, blah, blah, blah. But the way I always looked at it as a native person, this was me putting honor on all those women that have never been recognized before. This was me putting a blanket on them, making sure that the whole arena can see what they've done for us. Yeah. I would just like to interject as I was at the symposium um, that opened the exhibition in Minneapolis and I was actually in the overflow room and um, the energy that I could feel even in a space that was not even adjacent to the main auditorium was incredible. And um, I was convinced at that moment that I wanted to do some kind of show that related to this in some way. And so I'm gonna take this minute um, selfishly to just thank you for that kind of inspiration and uplift. Um, it's, I'm gonna remember it my whole life. It was meaningful, yeah. Um, oh, could I uh, just jump in there? I, I want to say, I think at the heart of that question too is this expectation maybe that there, there would be problems or there would be egos or there would be whatever. And so I, before I finished my fine arts degree, I was in a corporate survival, you know, situation, survival situation. But you know, you're really taught uh, stand up for yourself, don't, you know, every time you get a chance to talk that, you know, gets you more into people's attention. So you, you know, and when I sat around the table at the symposium, I was so struck by how gracious these women were. Like if two people were going to speak at the same time, almost the one woman who was speaking almost threw the microphone at the other lady to give her the chance, right? Like they were so respectful of each other. There weren't egos involved like you would expect of you know women of this caliber at this place in their careers who are so talented and they were so um they were so mission driven it was not i my impression for all of the women in that room was it was definitely not about them or who had or hadn't been asked it was all about the ancestors and the future uh, children and getting it done for that. And you could really sense that. And I don't think that kind of en energy ever went away, it, no matter how like stressed out. I mean, I would say even Jill, Terry and I were like, we have to do this. You know, we just, whatever it takes, we have to, we have to see this through till the end. Mm -hmm. But I would say there is, you know, institutions and, uh, you know, young curators who are going out there, you know, it does take patience and it does take resources and uh, like Jill said we had the resources because people believed in the process but I mean I think a lot of institutions would be scared to take on something like this because it costs them more it, it will cost them more could you talk and, a little bit about uh, how you worth it I'm sorry Dakota um could you could you talk a little bit and we don't have much time left but just how did you convince your funders that you know was it a hard sell Terry did it. Terry did it. All, we, we would fly in Terry, and we, Terry and I would present. I'd say, God damn it, you <laughs> need to fund this show. You're ignoring <laughs> all of American art by not funding this we, show. <laughs> we literally flew in Terry for these big meetings, and, and you know, um, it, it, we presented, and, you know, it was, it was Terry and their belief in our process. And I would say her belief in our process. And her belief in the process, yes. Coming from such an authentic place that yes. all of the funders could see like, okay, this is serious. Yes. And they the Metawakatan. And the Metawakatan. The Metawakatan put up money. We had a tribal nation that was behind us from the get-go and they put big money down on us and they never took that money off of us. And that was our little seed that made dang sure that this thing got all the way through. And uh, I will be forever grateful to the Metawakatan for that. 
yeah. well, me too, because they paid for my fellowship during. Yeah. It would. Especially. It wouldn't happen without that tribal community yeah. stepping up and being yes. involved in it at this level and at that kind of funding level. Yes. Yes. I Everybody. Everything else. Everything else fall, fell, followed through. Everything else just like they created the path and then everything else just fell into place after yeah. Midewalk and was believed in us and was committed to it. Um, it was only, it was possible through them. But I do think some of that was because of for sure Terry's presence and being able to relate to them as an indigenous person. And she really knew what what was important about this show and that sincerity came through. But also I think we did have a, such a commitment to involve a lot of native people that, um, I, I mean, I guess I'd have to ask them to be sure, but I feel like that was instrumental too for them. Yeah, absolutely. I can't thank you enough for your time and energy, your conviction, your ability to share with us this, in fact, this fantastic show, I encourage everyone to see it. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I hate to do it, but we've got to close down and, and wrap this up, but thank you so much. Thanks for inviting thank us. Thank you, Mary. Mary. Oh, thank you, audience for, for listening to us ramble on. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you, Mary.